thank you for the day and for the opportunity to be here and uh, for the fun and the education that we're receiving. And uh, we just pray your blessing. We're all here uh, because you chose us to be here for a reason and for a purpose. And we thank you that uh, Anthony can be here through Skype. And uh, we just uh, uh, want to listen to his teaching. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Nice to meet you. Yes. See you again sometime. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom here. You may have two handouts, certainly the single sheet. I hope you have. I still believe in paper. I know many of you still do not or don't any longer believe that paper counts, but the one entitled Confusion Over the Christian Gospel. As Churchill used to say, if you have a point to make, you make it very clearly. One point, you hammer it, go away and get a sledgehammer and hammer it again. I want you to understand that the knowledge of the gospel of the kingdom is as rare as the knowledge of the one God. And just to get people to believe in the one God, which is wonderful, if they haven't got the gospel defined correctly, they're still in need of teaching. So I entitled this little paper then, Confusion Over the Christian Gospel. Massive confusion. And I'm quoting from the Angers Bible Dictionary, if you have that sheet in front of you. You may have a second handout. I don't know if Barbara bothered to, to make you that one, but that's from a guy called Samdal, S-E-M-D-A-H-L. I corresponded with him recently, and he was very good to me, but he defines the gospel quite differently. And so you're going to get the point very clearly that Acts chapter 20, verses 24 and 25, are absolutely essential. Those two verses will change the world. In Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, Paul said that he'd been preaching the gospel of the kingdom and it was exactly the same as the gospel of the grace of God. That is brilliant, Paul, because that's exactly not what dispensationalism says. And there are Unitarian dispensationalists now, alas. So we must make sure that they understand that the gospel of the kingdom is the one and only gospel. So on this sheet, which is Anger's Bible Dictionary, I'm showing you very simply that there's a false distinction being made by evangelicals, particularly dispensationalists, in varying degrees. But the point is a very easy one. You're supposed to follow the teachings of Jesus. I repeat that. You're supposed to follow the teachings of Jesus. And 1 Timothy 6.3 and 2 John 7-9 to are absolutely fair warnings. If you do not hear people speak of the teachings of Jesus, watch out, you're being scammed. Come on now, You're watch, you must watch out because 1 Timothy 6, 3, Paul said, the teaching of Jesus is everything. The devil only has one major trick, and I'm talking about the external devil, that huge power of evil in the form of the devil. He ha only has one major trick. That's to separate you from the teachings of Jesus. You can go on saying, oh, I love the Lord. I've accepted the Lord. The Lord's in my heart vaguely. But if you haven't accepted his words, his gospel, you haven't really started. That's my Abrahamic point. I believe that in 1850, the Abrahamic people understood this perhaps better than we sometimes do now. So that's my overall point. You have absolutely every right to challenge everything and question it. But in the article that I've got for you, start by defining the gospel, which means God's spell, God's good news. And my goodness, if I'd gone out this morning and found that nobody in, in uh, Fayetteville here had heard of coronavirus, I would have been shocked. Listen, Fox News, and I'm not going to be partisan, Fox News, all they talk about is who's going to rule America. That's all they talk about. And they're very brilliant people. They've got their heads around all the facts, and I haven't on that issue. But what if everybody's saying, who's going to fix the world in the future? That's the only thing that counts. And that's why the Abrahamic people, I think, did so well. I remind you that we had to come traipsing across the earth to find Rebecca and Joe. Because nobody in England would accept us. Once we said the dead were dead, we were politely asked not to come back. And once we said the gospel is about the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus, Acts 8, 12, marvelous slogan, by the way, Acts 8, 12. It used to be the banner headline on our magazine. It's a brilliant slogan summary of what the Abrahamic people are all about. 
So once we said we believed in the gospel of the kingdom and in one God and a human Jesus, that was the end of it. Nobody in England. And we tried the charismatics, we tried the Baptists, we tried all the different forms of religion, which are less in number than here, and nobody accepted it. So my story is extremely simple. Here we are not being uh, threatened by people when we say God is one. I love that. Echad. Jesus is human, the human being miraculously con uh, conceived. And the gospel is about how you, I mean you, I know God and Jesus, but you are going to fix the world. Oh, people say, if I could just hold the door for a thousand years, stop it. God is more excited about your talent and the things you go through right now in training. And you are the royal family. I remind you that a couple of royals in England just recently gave up being royal. Did you see that? That's their privilege. They don't want all the limelight and the cameras. Fine. Let them have the do their thing. But you are the royal family, whether you like it or not. You are the elect. You've been elected. Barbara's yelling at me in the back for something. What are you saying? If, if that is, we measure up to the standard, the high standard that Jesus requires. So the top of my hand out here, here's how they define the gospel. Typically, Billy Graham says that Jesus came to do three days work. To die, to be buried, and to rise. I say that's false. With great respect to Billy Graham and all of his people, that is simply false. What in the world was Jesus doing before he even mentioned his death in Matthew 16? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So we recently came across a, a text, I'll give you this for your notes, in uh, 2 Chronicles 13, of all places, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 5. You have this amazing statement, 2 Chronicles 13. 13 and verse 8. Sorry, I got the wrong verse. 5 and 8, but 8 particularly. 8. Where it says in 2 Chronicles 13, 8. So now you intend to, re to resist the kingdom of the Lord in the hands of the sons of David. The devil has been mounting a campaign all these years to tell you there's no such thing as in the hands of the sons of David. That's what the kingdom is. So when, way back when I was teaching at your American school in London in the 70s, I used to ask the Salvation Army people with their, with their bonnets. I would go up to them and say, listen, I'm writing on this subject. I want to know, what is the gospel? And invariably, they would give me a ghastly King James mistranslation, says the kingdom of God is within you. That's all they knew. I'm not less excited about this than I was then because there's a vast ignorance about the kingdom. If you don't know about coronavirus, you haven't been around. If you don't know about Fox News and who's going to rule America, you haven't been around. If you don't know about the gospel of the kingdom, I suggest you haven't got on board with Jesus fully. You may understand that he's one, but you simply need to know that his gospel is about the kingdom. And the reason for that is that he's the second Adam. And he's as pained as we all should be about Adam's terrible mistake. Adam lost the kingship. So if you're the Messiah, you say, let's get the kingship going again. So you are the royal family, I think, in training. Through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom. So I've done this with the students. I've said, okay, let's see how much you know about the gospel of the kingdom. Let's start with Luke 4.43. And I said, do you know this verse? Most have never heard of it. They don't know. And I say to them, well, I've still got a job to do. That's great. I'm glad I'm not out of a job. Luke 4.43 says, I must preach. I'm duty bound. I'm driven like a sheepdog to preach the gospel about the kingdom. That's the reason for which I was commissioned. That's Jesus' mission statement, isn't it? Yeah. So then I pick up the, the, the book by a certain famous gentleman about the purpose-driven church. Now, it doesn't have a text index, so I have to plow through it to see what he says. It doesn't mention it. What? My dear man, get me on Hannity. Get me on, on uh, Ainsley, who has a Bible study. I want to ask the public, what's the gospel? And when they say, well, we really don't know. It's about Jesus dying and rising. That's fine, but that's not the whole thing. Then I've got something to say. Luke 4.43 is brilliant. I must preach the gospel about the kingdom of God to the cities also. That's why. I am compelled. If that's not your mission statement, you haven't got on board with that yet. Then Acts 8, 12, of course, is wonderful. That's the text that says, when they believed Philip, 
as he was going on about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, endlessly all day long, then they were ready to be baptized and not before that. Now I'm hearing of people who are denying water baptism. That is an atrocious error. What? You cannot shake your fist at Jesus and expect to be saved. No, they got baptized men and women. But a horrible thing came along called dispensationalism, which I want to show you on this paper with a capital D. And it said, no, 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 the gospel of the kingdom is not for you, not for you, not for you. That's the devil speaking. It doesn't get any worse than that. If you deny Jesus his own gospel, you have really undermined, I suggest, the whole New Testament revelation. So on our, our sheet then from Anger, they define the gospel from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Notice how they begin with Paul. That's odd, isn't it? Why would they begin with Paul and not with Jesus? So the second handout that you may have, the longer one, is from somebody called Samdal, trained at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, with whom I corresponded in a friendly way recently. He says, no, 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 the gospel of the kingdom is not for you. It's not for you, not for you, not for you. What? And you Abrahamics are smiling. You're saying, I need to help this person. So what are we going to do to help them? No, they define the gospel firstly from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, where Paul does rehearse some of the gospel. He says, you remember the gospel I preached to you? It was about how Jesus died and rose. And I told you these things, he says in that passage in 1 Corinthians 1 to 4. That was some of the gospel, not the whole. He says, I told you these things among things of first importance. He didn't say that was the entirety of the gospel. Otherwise, he would have been contradicting himself. Or as Bill Wattell used to say, he would have been putting himself under his own curse for not preaching the gospel. No, he always preached the gospel of the kingdom. Paul did, was following Jesus. But in this passage that they always cite, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, he lists things en protis, means among things of great importance. I preached the following things, which was that Jesus died and rose. That's wonderful. And he died, I think, on behalf of our sins. We believe in the vicarious atonement, the substitutionary atonement. Some of our forefathers, Unitarians, didn't always believe that. But yes, he died instead of us. I think that's a wonderful truth. Amen. Now then, in the second paragraph on your sheet that you may have, we have this. Many Bible teachers make a distinction, uh-oh, in the following. If you want to confuse people, you divide everything into two. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus has two natures. God is three and yet one and yet three and yet one. You divide everything up and it makes it chaotic. Now we're playing with pronouns. You mustn't say he or she. You've got to say it, maybe. We're shaking the universe once we destroy these means of communication. So many Bible teachers, says this Anger's <coughs> Bible Dictionary, says a distinction in the following. Number one, the gospel of the kingdom. And they define it correctly. The good news that God's purpose is to establish an earthly or on earth mediatorial kingdom in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7. Yes. We're looking for a renewed Jewish state in Israel. You can go there today. You won't find Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Hasn't happened yet. But that's what you're aiming at. And you are going to be there assisting Jesus with ruling the world. Take charge of five cities, ten cities. I didn't learn a word of this in the Church of England. Why not? I've spent the last 60 years wondering how it was that in the, quote, best education, Anthony, we lost the sound. Did you hit the the headset? Do you check your headset? Did you, is it unplugged? Did you hit the mute button on the? Is that better? Uh, yep, you hit the mute oh, button. Oh, go goodness. ahead. I mustn't get so excited. Sorry about that. Carlos, that's good. Good. I will not touch that by mistake. I'm so, 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 so very sorry. But sure. anyway, my point was that in those days when I taught at the American School in London in the 70s, 
I asked these dear people, what's the gospel? And they always said, well, it's, it's within you. That's the very opposite of where you start. Yes, I grant that the spirit of the kingdom is right here in the midst. I'm looking at the royal family right now. We are the kingdom in training, but by far the greater emphasis on the kingdom is that future event, a renewed Jewish state in Israel with Jesus sitting on the renewed throne of David. That's the most exciting thing you can imagine. Amen. That's, yeah, I hear an amen from Joe there. That's wonderful. It doesn't get any better than that. And I can, I can think of Joe's various expressions. It, that really is the best thing next to sliced bread or whatever you Americans say. Wouldn't you like to be able to say to people, don't build that tank, put that gun away. Don't imagine shooting another human being. You're going to do that. You are. So you are the royal family, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. So we've been using then Acts 8, 12. And I want to mention for your memory bank, Luke 8, 12, which is the parable of the sower. I tell the students the parable of the sower is everything. It's the parable without which you don't understand any parables. That's what Jesus said. So you work hard on Luke 8, Mark 4, and Matthew 13, because that's the seed message of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. When you get so excited about this, you will tell everybody and you get away with it in America because at the checkout counter, you can say things are bad now, aren't they? But wait till this coronavirus is over and the kingdom of God comes and they won't regard you as a complete fanatic. They may look at you a little oddly, but you'll get away with it. But how much are you telling your friends? How much are you begging the local pastor to preach on the kingdom if he doesn't? I think we had this responsibility. So there's the distinction then in my paper here. They make a distinction falsely between the gospel of the kingdom, which they define that correctly. And now look what they say. Two proclamations of the gospel of the kingdom are mentioned. One already passed. Uh-oh. We put that behind us according to this dictionary. That's the correct definition of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Two proclamations, they've divided into two, very confusing, are mentioned. One is already finished. It began with the ministry of John the Baptist, carried on by our Lord Jesus and his disciples, and it ended now. You are now seeing one of the greatest and most profound errors of all time. According to this dictionary, the gospel of the kingdom preaching ended after Jesus and John the Baptist have been preaching it. That doesn't get any more erroneous, in my humble opinion. So here's the trick. If you want to get rid of Jesus, you put him back under the old covenant. Very, very clever. Even the great C.S. Lewis says, the gospel is not in the gospels. What? The X-Way International people said, and say even, the gospel is not in the gospels. I quote, they say, I quote, strictly speaking, the gospels belong in the old covenant. That is absolutely false because you've now gotten rid of Jesus. And the warnings are very severe in 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 John 7, that if you get rid of the teachings of Jesus, you're, in, you're threatening your own salvation. Very, very dangerous. Okay, so then he says, in that middle paragraph there, the other preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is yet future. Okay, I get it. So we don't preach the kingdom now, according to them, but later on after the pre-tribulation rapture, which I think is also false, but at the beginning of the tribulation, that's when you can begin preaching the kingdom again, or Jews will do it. So what do you do now? You don't preach the kingdom. For me, that's the voice of the devil trying to mislead you. So the other preaching they say is yet future, and Joe apparently preached on this last night, 24, 14, this gospel about the kingdom, carefully worded by Matthew there. I love that. This gospel, the only one we know about, about the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. And then and only then will the end come. And I don't think that Joe preached you a pre-trib rapture last night. either. He doesn't complicate things by making the second coming a dual event. That's another confusion, not quite what we're dealing with today, but to be warned against. So the other preaching is yet future, they say, during the Great Tribulation, heralding the second coming. But you can see the point. 
Officially then, evangelicalism says that you shouldn't be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's really for Jews. Well, you people that I'm addressing this morning are the seed of Abraham. You're very Jewish spiritually. And the gospel, of course, was preached ahead of time to Abraham. We know that text well. You're very Jewish and very spiritually Abraham's children. And you have the burden then of preaching this gospel of the kingdom until the end. Then number two, here's the gospel of God's grace. That's so clever. That's why I started this morning by pointing out to you that Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, the gospel of the grace of God is exactly, exactly, exactly the same as the preaching of the kingdom. Those two verses, Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, will actually repair this whole damaged system. And F.F. Bruce, a good colleague of mine in some respect, because he took an interest in what I was doing um, many years ago, and he worked hard in his commentary on Acts to show that the gospel of the grace of God is precisely the same as the gospel of the kingdom. Don't let anybody pull those apart. F.F. Bruce was particularly good in that area. So there it is. And in my notes then on that page, I said, me, note that Acts 20.25 is left out. I've been to lectures by evangelicals where they've quoted the gospel about the grace of God and they've stopped and not mentioned this next verse, which is it's the same as the kingdom preaching. My understanding would be then, this is very gracious of God to give you the kingdom. That's that famous text in Jeremiah where God says that he's made the birds and the bees and everything you can see. And he wants to give all of that to you. That's rather generous, isn't it? Every animal, every tree, everything we see is a gift then to you. And he loves you so much. He is so interested in what you're doing that he wants you to fix this world on a scale which you haven't seen. As they say in Georgia, I'm not supposed to do this. You ain't seen nothing yet, but I'm going to do it because it's humorous for me. You ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till you fix the world along with Jesus. That is Daniel 7, 27. If you haven't got the book of Daniel coursing through your bloodstream, you haven't got the kingdom central. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Okay, so gospel of God's grace then is exactly the gospel of the kingdom. Over the page, the third option they give you is a different gospel. The more I live, the more I feel that Paul and the rest of the Bible writers are very concerned about truth. If you don't believe in the truth, you believe in lies. And the notion is, well, if you're a good person, you're doing fine. Well, there are a lot of very good people. I don't doubt that. But because they didn't have a love of the truth, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, a passion for truth, they're not going to be saved. I don't like that. I mean, that's not my British style. (laughs) I'd rather get everybody saved. Because I was taught jolly good chap theology in England. that Everybody's a jolly good chap. Well, maybe they're not. So the love of the truth in order to be saved is a key verse, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Then they make a good point, partially good point here. They say, actually, it's not very good. They say that any other gospel, this is number three on the second back of, of your handout, some sort of human merit. Oh, oh, we mustn't have any works in it. Oh, it's a false gospel. That's a lie. I thought Jesus said something about struggle to enter the kingdom of God, didn't he? That sounds like some effort to me. And uh, the late Kent Ross used to say, our charter in the theological conference coming up for the 30th one shortly, our charter is to struggle for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. That's what we're trying to do. That sounds like a bit of effort to me. So the notion that all you do is just believe rather vaguely and nothing you could do would interrupt your salvation is also false. The once saved, always saved idea is obviously not true. We have to persist to the end and it's through much tribulation we're destined to enter the kingdom of God. I love that. And Kent was a great help to us in that respect. Okay, you can see where we're going then. If you detach Jesus from his teachings, you're threatening your salvation. This is a very serious issue. 
So we must insist that the gospel of the kingdom, Acts 8, 12, Luke 8, 12, the parable of the sower, Mark 4, the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. And I've got another one for you, another 8, 12. Amos 8, 12. I woke up this morning thinking about this one. Amos 8, 12 says there's a famine at some stage, a famine of hearing the word of God. Now, here's another key. The word of God is not just a synonym for the Bible. People say, got the word of God here. It's not wrong. You do have the words of God in scripture, but the word of God is a technical in-house term for the gospel about the kingdom. Jesus, as Steve Taylor used to say, had a magnificent obsession with the kingdom. Speak to yourself a moment. Do you have that same passion for getting people saved through the gospel of the kingdom and the things concerning Jesus? Then I think that's a measure of how well we're doing. So if you would then take that very seriously, you will find yourself doing the kingdom of God texts in the book of Acts. In other words, if the devil has tried to separate Jesus from his teachings by saying that Paul is really the founder of Christianity, which is absolutely false, dispensationalism, even C.S. Lewis got it wrong, then you must rejoin Paul to Jesus. And the way of doing that is to say, look, in the book of Acts written by Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament probably than anybody else, our beloved brother and Dr. Luke insists in the book of Acts that Paul was preaching exactly the same gospel of the kingdom as Jesus had. So I have the students and we do this, this class called the kingdom gospel. If you'd like to have my handout, by all means, send me an email. I'd like to send it to you because interesting quotes there. You can email me at anthonybuzzard at mindspring.com. I'll send that over by email if you like. It gives you lots of interesting quotes on the kingdom subject. But here in the book of Acts, clearly, Paul and, of course, Jesus, after he came back from death, for 40 days, what's that, six weeks? He went on about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in Acts 1-3. So that's the first of your eight kingdom texts, which you rattle off your friends whenever you can. Acts 1-3, kingdom of God was Jesus' continued interest, 1-3. And then in Acts 1-6, this is a very fascinating verse. In Acts 1-6, his students, his disciples said to Jesus, okay, Lord, Messiah, has the time now finally come for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? I would advise you not to be a Calvinist. John Calvin, who murdered Servetus, one of our Unitarian people, said, there are more errors in that question than there are words. Calvin did not understand the kingdom of God. Luther said that the book of Revelation is not a Christian book. What? The book of Revelation is 440 allusions and citations of the Old Testament prophets. Luther said, now he changed his mind a little bit towards the end of his life, but initially said the book of Revelation is not a Christian book. What? It's all about the kingdom, of course. So I want to get this idea over to you. The devil hates the gospel of the kingdom. He'll work against it with all of his trickiness, all of his systematic, uh, methodical, error to keep the kingdom of God away from you because he knows and this is Luke 8 12 he knows that if you get near the kingdom you're going to get saved and he doesn't want you to have immortality that's Luke 8 12 whenever the kingdom of God is preached the devil is there ready to snatch away the kingdom so that they may not believe it and be saved excuse me that's a high powered verse right Believing the kingdom has to do with being saved. So I would recommend we keep that central. Then in Acts 8.12, we've got that one, the famous Abrahamic text, 8.12. And then next comes 14.22 in the book of Acts, where, Jesus, where Paul said, through much tribulation, we're destined to enter the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? All of us in this room, all of us talking this morning know that there have been times of extreme tribulation. That's because you're the Navy SEALs. And God wants to know what's in your heart before he lets you loose on the world. I can, I can work with that. I understand it. So 1422, through much tribulation, we're destined to enter the kingdom. And then in 1908, 
of Acts. Paul went into the synagogue where he found an audience and he argued with them. Please note, he argued with them week after week after week, trying to convince them about the kingdom. That's Acts 19.8. When have you been doing that recently? How much are you arguing through the local newspaper? What are you doing to insist on the gospel of the kingdom? That's our question, I think. So then over after 19.8, we arrive at Acts 20, verses 24 and 25. We've mentioned them already. Gospel of the grace of God is the same as the gospel of the kingdom. And finally then, in Acts 28, our brother Luke, you see, was obsessed with the kingdom. He wanted us to understand that in Acts 28, verse 23, Paul talked to the Jews about the kingdom of God. And when some of them believed and others wouldn't be persuaded, he said, okay, you are rejecting the kingdom of God message. I'm going to go to the Gentiles now. And so at the very end of Acts, Acts 28, verses 30, 31, he went to Gentiles and preached exactly the same message of the kingdom. I'm getting the point, you know. Again, I didn't understand a word of this in the Church of England. That's why I'm here doing what we're doing today. Very easy. So that's the kingdom point. The other handout that you may have, I don't know whether Barbara bothered to photograph those Anthony, pages for you. Yes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. You do have that one. Thank you. You have the one called um, How It Is Falsely Denied in Contemporary Evangelical Church. You have that. Good. Thank you, Barbara, for photographing all that. But you'll find, if you turn to the last page, page eight, this is by somebody called Don Samdal. And he was busy trying to convince me that I shouldn't be doing the gospel of the kingdom. And you'll see then in those columns on the left, the gospel of the kingdom, that was for Jesus and the John the Baptist. It required repentance, heaven forbid. Well, of course, the true gospel requires repentance. So in those columns, you'll see what you are up against, maybe, with dispensationalism. And you'll see what that is. The name of the guy then is Dr. Somdal if that's clear to you. So please do not think that that second handout is what, is what things should be. This is how it shouldn't be done. So I said, they say falsely, and there you have that whole script. It will stimulate you to give them the simplicity of the truth. Okay, we've got five minutes. Do we have any comments from anybody? Shout me down. I'm used to being shouted down, but I do think that this is so central. Anybody want to say anything? Anthony, uh, I thought we're, we're changing the schedule because Joel's not here. Uh, okay. Joel is not here. Okay. Joel, Joel is not here. Joel Hemphill. Hemphill. So I was yeah. just thinking, since you have this other paper, yes. maybe we'll take a small break if, if you're up to. Absolutely. I, I'm up to it. This is just this is fun. Absolutely. Or nine o'clock on Sunday morning. Okay. Uh, but, uh, we have, things in, yeah, we have a few questions, so maybe take a break. Let's, right, Carlos? Take a break and then have questions. Fine, perfect. All right, thank you. Yep. See you later. Uh, we we can keep uh keep this stream going if you don't mind. Yeah, keep it keep it going. Yep. We'll a, thank you. We're gonna take about a five ten minute break. Yep. All right. And uh, questions would be wonderful. Questions and then uh, maybe the presentation of the second paper. All right. Th yes. Thank you, Tom. So let us know when you're ready. And Anthony, if you want to take a, yep. a bathroom break or something. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we're here, too. Carlos, did I get that right? They want to do Sunday morning for the second paper. Is that right? No. No. no, no, we're going to do the, the second. We're not going to do Sunday morning. We're going to do it here in just a little bit. Okay, got it. 15 minutes. That's fine. Okay. Yep. Five or 10. Yep. We'll just go ahead and do it. We'll, we'll do it now and fill up that slot with uh, your second paper. Right. Okay. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you a little bit. Is that what you want to do? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
uh, I want to tell you I had uh, two experiences about Kingdom of God, and uh, I, I defy you and say. He can't hear you. Uh, okay. And I will call you. Uh, I have your phone number, and I had a two experiences about kingdom. What is the meaning of kingdom of God? Absolutely, I would love it. Yes, you're our Armenian English-speaking Armenian person. <laughs> One. No. Do you have my phone number? Yes. 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 Give us a call. I would love to talk to you. It'd be fun. Okay. Okay. I will call you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Wonderful. Hey. Good morning. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, good to see you. You're looking good. It looks great. Yeah, no, we, we did. It's a fun subject. You know, you can you can go on for hours on this subject. <laughs> Nobody does it better than you. Well, that's the only thing I know. Hey, not yeah. Kathy Cunningham. Yeah. Really? I miss you. I yeah. miss you, too. I preached on Daniel 9 last night, and she talked about the Antichrist. And I love it. Uh, you know. You know, Daniel's my favorite, so. Of course it is. It's post-trib, you know. We, we I must believe it is. Tribulations go through the kingdom. So I absolutely. Think the great apostasy is brought on by the pre-trib disappointment and being left behind. <laughs> absolutely. Could well be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe. Yes, go ahead, Carly. Can, can um, so after Anthony, is Dale... Yes, Dale's going to be presenting, I think, at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Can, can we keep this stream going? So uh, It'll be a little difficult, but, but I think we... Dale is doing his uh, PowerPoint on this computer. I don't know. I'm not the technical guy, but <laughs> Dale, Dale's right here. It's okay with me, Carlos. Yeah, sure. It's, about, it's going to be about John 1. Oh, oh great. Wonderful. wonderful. So, so we can keep the Zoom going and... We're streaming on on uh, our channel, YouTube channel, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. We'll, I don't have with it. me. You might want to ask the conference folk about that. <laughs> oh, I, I think that'd be fine. Uh, I don't have the technology, but we'll turn the uh, computer around when you can, where you can see. Right. You're, you're on a laptop, right? Yeah, we're just on a laptop. Right? right. So simply turn it to face the speaker and let it run. Thank oh. you. <laughs> and and if we can do this, Joe, also for the rest of today. Uh, so I see Kathy. Is Seth there? Let's see. Uh, yeah, Kathy is at one thirty. Yes. So there's a big break between eleven forty-five and one thirty. You could re restart it at one thirty if you want. So I. Right. Totally up to you. Uh, right. So who do I email the link to? Uh, Tom New again? Yes. But yes. If you restart it, just email the link to Tom. Okay. And Craig picks it up and he can restart it. So okay. we'll go to 12 and then you'll restart it at 1.30. Is that what you're wanting to do? Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you have a long break, we'll stop it and then start again. Uh, he wants to uh, continue broadcast until 12 and then come back and pick up Dale. Yeah, yeah, he wants to do Dale. So we we'll just turn the computer around. Oh, yeah, that's that's fine with everybody here, Carlos. Uh, and then uh, I see Seth Ross is speaking at 2.30. No, Seth is not here. I thought we'd give everybody a longer break. Okay. Um, so it may be good to just cut it off as well, but if you want Kathy, we could you could start it back up at 1.30. Okay, so we'll do Kathy, and then we'll do Pastor Dan is there? Yeah, 3.30 is Dan. 
And then we'll do you tonight if that's okay. Sure, that'd be fine. That'd be Great. Fine. So I'll send uh, Tom the links as we stop okay. and go. Thank you. Okay. That sounds good. Anthony, hey. I, I was just yeah. wanting to make a point with you. Yes. That, you know, I, I love this. This is this is perfect present. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I was looking yeah. back at Acts, you know, 28, 23. Yes. It, it seems like Paul really got serious because it said <laughs> he was explaining to them and solemnly testifying. So this is like serious stuff, solemnly testifying. Yeah, absolutely. And trying to persuade them. Yes, argue, argue. Heaven forbid he argued it. Go through the logic. Come let us reason together. <laughs> I love it. So they're trying to, re he's trying to reason with the especially the, the Jewish people. Mm. So it, it's not easy. I was, I was thinking about the struggles of Bill Slayton. It's not easy. No. But you have to keep pushing. That's right. No, I, I agree with you totally. Um, yeah. I, I look back and I think, where was I for the first 20 years of my life? I've never heard of any of this. Nothing. So we don't want to I was only introduced to it when I started listening to Jim Madison. Well, he was a good mentor for you. Wonderful. Yeah. And then the last two verses, for two full years, you know, he's welcoming all who came to him. Yes. By the way, that is Luke 8, 11. Jesus welcomed the people and yeah. began talking about the kingdom. So that's what you do. You say, you all come in. Let me talk about the kingdom. So the first thing, what is uh, I was talking to your friend, uh, Bill Lawrence, the other day. Oh, yes. We need to ask people, what do you think is going to happen when you die? Absolutely. And eventually, we need to get to the kingdom. Oh, absolutely. It's the, it's the ultimate yeah. prize. It's the ultimate prize. I read your book, by the way, with great interest. The, the, only, the only sentence that I, I just quailed, it wasn't a criticism, but just, just I, I a it, uh, only one sentence out of the whole book where you said, let's not be too judgmental about the state of the dead. I would say, absolutely, let's pound against going to heaven when you die. <laughs> you know, I was trying to be nice to friends of ours. I know you were. And yeah. you know who I'm talking about. Yes, of course. Not the wrong video. I'm not going to say. Yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. But the book is really good. I loved it. I loved it. I read it all with great interest. I've been doing a lot of research on Yeshua. Yes. And so, oh, sure. John 20, 31. These are written that you might believe that oh. he is the Messiah. Not that he's gone. That he's the Messiah. Sound like uh, Rebecca convinced you and, and, and Jim did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll get going in about five minutes. I'll, okay, I'll go for about five minutes now, five minutes more. How long? No, take about 15 minutes. Okay, that's fine. And then we'll catch up later. Right. And come back. Uh, well, if you want to, I, I think Tom is saying you can go for 30 minutes and then we'll pick up Dale. Okay. Well, I don't want to take from Dale's time. Whatever. I, I've I've covered my ground fairly well. I can do a little bit with the second paper here. Okay. I'm just trying to go with the flow with Tom, whatever he wants. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so you yeah. Yeah, Anthony, I think Tom wants you to fill in for Joel, who was supposed to go from okay. ten to eleven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, take some time. If you want to take a break and get some water, that's before. Yeah, yeah I've got I've got I've got water here. Thank you. And remember, we're streaming on YouTube, so. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to keep a good flow and keep Tom involved to keep things going. Thank Absolutely. you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. <laughs>
<clears throat> so Anthony, you'll go for yeah. another forty minutes or so. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I need all that. Yeah. All right. Go back in. Uh, yeah. Thirty minutes, and then yeah. uh, we're going to turn it over to Dale this morning uh, for the rest of it. Uh, but. Uh, Anyway, uh, okay, so you want me to go another half hour now? Is that do I understand? Yeah, about a half hour. Okay, great. all right, Tom. Thank you for for running this whole show. It's wonderful, a lot of work. Yeah. Wonderful, I, I, I it couldn't be done without all the help of no, that's uh, right, uh, Alyssa and Craig and Barbara and others. Absolutely, and Terry is there somewhere, I'm sure. Oh, he's a sorry thing, but yeah. Yeah. We love Terry. He wasn't here now. Okay. All right. So we're going to turn it over to you, Anthony. Okay. Okay. And, uh, uh, All right. Well, thank you so much for the extra time. Uh, I, it's the only thing that makes any sense to me at all is the gospel of the kingdom. And you can ask any of thousands of sites on the internet. I hope you'll do this maybe for 15 minutes a day. Go to one of many sites offering salvation and simply say to them, what's the gospel? And the astonishing thing is they will never say, almost without exception, unless they were ex-Armstrong people. It was our background where we had some idea of the kingdom mixed with a whole lot of nonsense in other areas. But they will never say, it's the gospel of the kingdom. Well, they don't sound like Jesus if they don't say it's the gospel of the kingdom because he was obsessed with that. I love that. That is very, very satisfying. And I think the Abrahamic people from the 1850s grasped something that was absolutely huge. I used to, to joke with Seth. I'd go in his office and say, do you realize you're the president of the only biblical Unitarian college in the world? And it became a sort of standing uh, uh, repartee between us. I should perhaps have said also, do you realize you're the president of the only college that's really got the gospel of the kingdom, but we need to do more with it. So if this is wrong, scripture is wrong for me. I love it because I, I'm tortured, as you guys are, by the killing and the hatred and especially American politics today. It's so hateful, so divided. Wouldn't you love the time when Jesus says the kingdom is now established? Let's learn Let's learn to be gentle with each other, kind to each other. Let's not kill each other anymore. And a completely new world order. We've been saying there's going to be a new sheriff in town. I'm trying to find American ways of saying this. A new sheriff in town. The world is going to be under new management. And you are those managers in training. So again, my joke, well, if I could just sit there for a thousand years, and do nothing. No, you'd be very bored with that. It's not much better than playing a harp on a pink cloud, because that's all that this idiot talking to you used to know. In my Church of England days, I vaguely thought that if I was a good chap, and I wasn't a good chap, really, then I would play a harp in the sky forever. It doesn't get any worse than that. When you hate the lie, you're going to love the truth. But what we mustn't do is compromise with lies and converge or mix with systems that aren't fully on board with the gospel of the kingdom, I think. We must stand for the truth. Anyway, that's my point. On the second handout, which Barbara kindly photographed for you, this is how not to do the gospel. And so on the last page, eight, it says, this is by Don Samdal, S-A-M-D-A-H-L. He says anybody can reproduce this, but this shows how not to do the gospel. And he and I engaged in decent conversation for several months. And he's convinced that you don't preach the gospel of the kingdom. If you did, you'd be doing it wrong because that's only for Jews. So the columns on page one, on the left, the gospel of the kingdom, that's for John the Baptist and Jesus and the 12, preach only to Jews. That is absolutely strikingly false to me. And we need to work against that. If that's only for Jews, that counts you and me out. So let's be simple and straightforward with the gospel of the kingdom. 
And the gospel of the grace of God, this is how not to do it. And mind you, this page, this whole second handout is how not to do the gospel. They maintain that Paul preached the gospel of grace and only for Gentiles. And that gospel of grace requires faith plus nothing. No efforts, no repentance, no baptism. I think that's quite wrong. Let's not give up on our basic truths like baptism in water. I'm sure that if Jim Madison was still living, he would resonate very well with all of this material. He was a huge inspiration to me, by the way. He wrote endless letters to me, typed out uh, over the years, and I really appreciate that inspiration. So you have all of that there, those columns. Let me give you Luke 16, 16. This is a wonderful text, which we only come, came across recently. Luke 16, 16, all the eights there says, the law and the prophets were until the John the Baptist. And from that time on, the kingdom of God is being preached. So Christianity is the preaching of the kingdom of God there. The same in Galatians. Galatians 3, 19 to 29. We've used that passage a lot. Remember, we're dealing with former Jehovah's Witnesses on a rather large scale now. And you soon find that the Jewish roots idea is one of the things we're threatened by. You do not need to keep the Sabbath in the letter. If you're weak and are still observing the food laws, that's fine. But I think Paul would say, get over that. Because Galatians 3, 19 to 29 Paul says, okay, what about the law? The law of Moses in the letter, that is, Galatians 3, 19 to 29, was given as an interim after the covenant with Abraham. It wasn't permanent. I was taught exactly the opposite in the Armstrong days. And I then began to keep the Sabbath day, not understanding at all what Paul said here, and that was totally disruptive. I couldn't go to weddings anymore on Saturday. I had to go to church. So I'm very much against keeping the law of Moses in the letter. And the famous text in 1 Corinthians 9, 20, where Paul says, I, Paul, am a Jew. And I am not under the law. And Armstrong came up with a very phony translation of that verse. He said, Paul said that he was not under the penalty of the law. That's a lie. I want to make that quite clear for the tape. Paul said, I, Paul, am a Jew. I'm a Christian. I'm not under the law of Moses. That's beautiful. You don't need to be under the law of Moses in the letter. <clears throat> if you don't want to eat shellfish and pork, that's your business. But you don't need to be restricted by those things. So 1 Corinthians 9.20 is wonderful. Galatians chapter 3, 19 to 29, Paul is wonderfully diplomatic. He'll do anything to keep you happy, provided it isn't the ultimate standard. But he's very, very diplomatic. And he then says in one place, if I were still teaching circumcision in the flesh, which he's not, why am I being persecuted? That's in Galatians too. also. You see, the book of Galatians we didn't do in Armstrong days. We didn't do that book. I remember so well in, in the college in 1965, I was over there in, in his college in Pasadena. We didn't do the book of Galatians because it defeated us utterly. It's a great charter of freedom there, a wonderful book, where Paul also says you mustn't get the gospel wrong. If anybody teaches a gospel other than the true gospel, let him be a curse. And he doubles that curse. That's awful stuff. I don't want to be under a curse. And as I said to you before, Bill Wattell used to say, Paul would have put himself under his own double curse if he'd preached a gospel other than the gospel of the kingdom. So the point is clear. I hope you, you enjoy the rest of that. If you feel like engaging Don Somdahl, product of Dallas Theological Seminary, no less, where he says that he had to give up everything he learned in order to learn not to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You could engage him in gentle conversation. You might change his mind. So it's a very good exercise in arguing decently. And Joe and I were talking about that in the break. In 1908 of Acts, Paul went in the synagogue and argued with them for three weeks. So I would say to the students, and I enjoy doing this class at the college so much, 
I would say to the students, could you spend two years arguing the kingdom just using the Old Testament? Could you do it for three weeks? Could you do it for two years or six months? Paul was obviously driven by the kingdom. And so that's my point to you today. The kingdom of God gospel is everything. Think about the text in the gospels, remembering then that C.S. Lewis says, the gospel is not in the gospels, that is false. Some of our ex way international people still say, and I quote, the gospels strictly belong in the Old Testament. That's a falsehood. They don't because you've just gotten Jesus out of the way. <laughs> don't want to do that. To love Jesus is to love what he said. Actually, the book of John says that over and over again. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you refuse to do what I say? I get it. So when people will say in the future, in the most awful text there is in the Bible by far, in, act, in Matthew 7, 21, multitudes will say to me in that future day, Lord, Lord, look what we did for you. We preached in your name. We did miracles in your name. We did all kinds of things in your name. Get out of here. What? Get out of here. I don't want to fall into that error. So the solution then, the antidote to that threat is to make sure we do the words and the teachings of Jesus, which is exactly what dispensationalism systematically doesn't do. So Sean doesn't like that I attribute this to him, but he came up, I think, with OSAS, once saved, always saved, and no SAS, not once saved, always saved. These are precious truths to be guarded very uh, strongly by Abrahamic people if we want to reflect what we did early on in the 1850s. The danger is that the environment becomes too friendly and we lose our sense of uniqueness and zeal for truth. Of course, we believe in the wider hope, and that's the idea that those who've never heard of Jesus are not doomed. I created a, a bit of a, as we say in England, a guffuffle by suggesting that millions of people who've never heard of Jesus in the second resurrection would not be condemned for not knowing about Jesus of whom they had never heard. That is a rather liberating view for me. God will deal with people according to what they reasonably could know. That's the famous text then in John, where Jesus said to his audience, if I hadn't come and told you, you wouldn't be guilty. But now, he said to them, now that I've told you, you know better. Isn't that strikingly interesting as justice? So I do watch the news with great interest because all they're talking about is justice and judgment. How are we going to fix the world? And they're struggling to do it. But I don't think that Hannity and Ainsley with her Bible study understands the gospel of the kingdom. So let's get Joe on there. I want to see Joe on Hannity. Let's get him on, on there talking about these things. There's nothing more liberating. And this is not just boring doctrine. One of the devil's great lines is, oh, you're too much intellect, Anthony. Too much thinking. Wait a minute. I thought we're supposed to love God with all of our mind. And that Greek word, the yania, is the most intellectual word there is. And it does say in John that Jesus came to give us an understanding, the yania, that's the most intellectual word there is, an understanding as to how to love God. So we who teach, you know, have to insist on those verses too. Remember that Jesus said, I'll send them scribes. Those are professionals. I'll, among my team, I'll have scribes. I'll send them scribes and even then they won't listen. So it continues to be an extraordinary battle, but Hope is, of course, the source of love and faith in Colossians 1.4. Your faith and your love are because of your hope. So if your hope is shaky, if you vaguely think you might go to heaven and play harps on pink clouds, then your love and your faith are going to be equally shaky. That seems to me the way it is. Okay, do we have any comments from the audience at all, Joe? Or, Thanks, Anthony. Uh, yeah. I asked all the tables to come up with questions. and. Yeah. So Tom's table, what question do you have? Yes, please. Eric, Tom? Shout it out loud. Uh, anybody? Just a little more about the resurrection. Oh, oh yes. Resurrection hope. Resurrection hope. This is, of course, absolutely basic. And if you were the devil, you want to undermine the resurrection and hence the parousia. I use the Greek word parousia all the time now. We found in Australia that we had some Greek-speaking people in the audience, and they liked the way I was pronouncing their language as a Greek 
does today. So I cash in on that a little bit. The parousi, of course, the second coming is everything. So we, talking to each other this morning, are Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, but we are Adventists. And certainly I knew nothing about that at all in my Church of England days. So as Adventists, then the parousi is everything. That's the event of the future resurrection, what Luke calls in Luke, what is it, 16 or so, the Luke version, the resurrection of the just. Yeah. It's the thing we're aiming at, the resurrection of the just. Many of those sleeping in the dust of the ground, this is Daniel 12, as do use all the time, uh, will awake from the sleep of death, some to the life of the age to come. So you can confidently talk about eternal life as the life of the age to come. That immediately puts that future age on the map. And Joe and I used to rejoice and talked about this often with George Ladd. I think that we went to see George Ladd before he died. He was actually an advocate of much of what we're doing. And I don't broadcast cast this much, but when I w got my degree there at Bethany Seminary, I got some very complimentary things from the professors. They said, the more we hear about what you and your church, well, it wasn't my church, the more we hear about what you and your church are saying, the more we agree with it. So there are people out there who are hungry for this clear idea of the resurrection, the resurrection of the just. And I love the prayer of Hezekiah who was dying. God just, changed his mind. Anthony, yeah. I just reread Lad's Gospel of the Kingdom, and I forgot the page number, 36, 37 or something yep. like that. It says, until Jesus comes, we do not have the ultimate kingdom. And so Wonderful. all the notion of, you know, kingdom now and so on. Absolutely. So we're citizens of the kingdom, but we don't have the kingdom until the parousia. Jesus I love that. It's so nice to have some backing because he was a, a, the star of the Plymouth Brethren. You know that lad was the bright boy of the Plymouth Brethren. And I've got letters in my file handwritten from him where he encouraged us. He even said that he didn't think that Paul believed in the pre-existence of Jesus. He thought that on the whole, John did, but Paul didn't. Well, I mean, that's praise God for the Abrahamic people. I do want us to realize, though, that we're sitting on treasures here and we mustn't let them fall through our fingers for lack of activity. I have a I have yes. another statement and question. Please. You you talked about Galatians 3:19 yes. but I love Galatians 3:8. Yes. Because uh, I'll read it in the NASB the scripture yes. seeing God would justify the Gentiles by faith preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful. It's beautiful, Joe. I, I love that. The world is going to be blessed through the king and yes. the kingdom that is to come. Exactly right. And I love the fact that the gospel was preached to Abraham. So the Abrahamic idea, we must celebrate all the time. Keep it forefront. Acts 8, 12 was a brilliant slogan. You know, everybody has his slogans. You've heard of uh, you only pay for what you need, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got a slogan out there. They're selling every useless thing. And we are selling, in quotes, and we're not making money out of this. And we are, in fact, supported generously by people. That's, that's absolutely uh, coincidental. But if this isn't worth selling and propagating, I don't know what it is. And I think we'll be held guilty if we don't make a splurge about the kingdom of God. So isn't that brilliant? Galatians 3.8. Treasure in the field, the pearl of great price. Any questions or comments? Wonderful. Yeah, I'll make a comment. Um, first of all, can you hear me okay, Brother Anthony? What's that? Can I you can hear, hear me okay? I can. Sounds like Lonnie, am I right? It is. I guess I better come up there. Hang on a second. Yeah, come a little closer to the camera. I'm kind of surprised I have a pretty loud voice anyway. <laughs> it's all right, but you're even better when I can see your face. That's well, even better. You're doing well. <laughs> I appreciate that. No. Just very quickly, um, I you mentioned in passing Matthew 24, 14. Yes. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in, in the entire world as yes. to all nations. Yes. And then the end will come. Yes. Um, the reason that I I I kind of consider that to be, for lack of a better terminology to use, the hidden verse of Matthew 24, because how many how many end time teachers and preachers do you ever hear using that verse? We always hear, and, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about all of the trouble and tribulation that's going to come, yep. but that 
But Jesus himself said, when those things happen, the end is not yet come. Yep. The end is not going to happen until That's right. the gospel of the kingdom has been preached in the entire world. Right. But nobody, it seems like that nobody, uh, I mean, I asked Brother, you know, Brother Tom has done a lot more uh, research into Bible prophecy. I know, I mean, I, I'll just readily acknowledge I haven't done much myself. Yep. But, he, you know, even he has said that he hasn't heard hardly anybody ever mention this verse. And yet I think it's one that's very... On a certain level, not not all the way, but on a certain level, I think you can use that verse as a bit of a gauge when it comes to, hey, how close to the end are we coming here? Absolutely. Not when we see, and hope and pray it never happens, not if we see a dirty bomb go off in Chicago or no. this, like the coronavirus or anything like that, but how is the gospel of the kingdom coming yeah. along when it, when it comes to being spread around the entire yes. world? No, I think it's a great question. And, and Paul, uh, Peter, you know, has that statement about hastening. The more work we do, the quicker it comes. That's possible. So I, I will say that the Internet, of course, has totally changed our life. We've got over 3,000 videos out there. I can't believe how all this happened. Yeah. But I do wish as a team, though, all of us could be doing individually more than we do. I, I do think it's possible. But it takes time going on the Internet to argue. Heaven forbid. Yes, to argue. People like to be argued with. If you do it in a decent way. There's a difference between arguing and quarreling. And arguing Absolutely. Is a good one-on-one -on -one exchange. A quarrel is when you start doing this. You know, and, and we don't want to do that. Don't Nobody's don't going to be won. Nobody's going to be won over by that. But I don't know. I'm only talking to you, Lonnie, right now, because some kind Christadelphian was kind enough to come and tap me on the shoulder and say, your pre-existent Jesus is wrong. Now, we'd been beaten down, you know, by a whole Armstrong experience, but I was argued into this, and delightedly so. Sure. So I do spend, I've just recently been talking to a very earnest Christadelphian about the devil. And my goodness, it's been fascinating. I've learned, I wake up thinking about this. The devil, I don't think it's a personification of evil. No. I'm not supposed to say that because it's, a, you know, I, I'm going to say it anyway because of the freedom I have. But really, we need to get some of these things right. Even we as a group can have some things wrong and that's not doing us any good. So let's pray, oh God, give us more truth, more energy and more excitement over these great truths. So yeah. good to see you looking good, by the way. You're well, obviously back in strength. Tell, uh, tell your family that I said hi and I hope they're doing well. It's, uh, we wish you were here, but uh, yes. We're, 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 but like you said a moment ago, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great that we have the internet, the internet, isn't it? It is wonderful. I have no idea. I mean, how, how much is the whole world has to know about the kingdom of God? I don't think we're there yet. No. I have no, I mean, Kathy Cunningham and I agree totally. Let's not set any dates. We don't want to do that. But the Middle East is pretty scary. The Middle East is the fourth kingdom for us. Jim Madison believed that too, by the way. I talked him into that way back. And I think that's right. The Middle East, rather than Europe, as I was taught earlier, but the Middle East is pretty scary now. And Iraq seems to be something to do with it. Babylon and the river Euphrates, as somebody said, that doesn't really move around much. So something on the Euphrates, I don't know. But I'm, I'm listening to you guys. I want to hear what you have to say, and Kathy particularly, who spends a lot of time with this. Well, I'm going to move on here, brother. It's good talking to you. Thank you Great again. talking to you. Thank good you. Good to yes. see you, Lonnie. God yeah. bless. Well, thank you. Tell your wife I said hi. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, we have... We have oh, that's Kathy. Tell us what's going on. Get, set the date for us. <laughs> You'll have to tune in at 1.30. <laughs> I will. No, I'll be listening. We're going to be talking about Islamic eschatology. Good. Psalm 83 that you yes. want to talk about. Absolutely. It's really an ongoing saga, not a once and done event. That's right. But Psalm 83 is key. You know that Bill Wattell was into Psalm 83. You might know that. Psalm 83. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you talking about that. We need much more of it. Why don't you get a broadcast going somewhere? Couldn't you do more videos? Well, if I had a wife, I could. But I have a <laughs> husband. <laughs> Good to talk with you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Would you define uh, spiritual when it says raise the spiritual body in First Corinthians 15? Uh, if some natural body raise the spiritual, would yep. you define that for us, please? Spiritual? Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very unusual phrase there. Pnevma pnevmatikon, a soma, sorry. A soma, a body which is described as pnevmatikon, spiritual body. But of course, that doesn't mean that he was without flesh and bones. Because he said, I touch me, I have flesh and bones. But he wasn't flesh and blood. And flesh and blood means you in your normal human state now. So in the resurrection, you're going to get a spiritual body, but you're going to be recognized for who you are. Otherwise, how could we say when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom, <clears throat> how would you recognize them if they were just uh, blobs, you know, without shape and form? So spiritual body would be a body, a real body, tangible, palpable, but driven with new powers that we can't imagine now. So you could walk through a wall even and come and go at will, but it's still a body, which is very un-Greek. You see, the Greeks couldn't understand that at all. So there it is. Yes, a spiritual body. And uh, that's where the Abrahamic people have been so strong that you're actually going to be palpable, visible, touchable in the resurrection. None of that happens until the post-tribulational resurrection. Joe and I <coughs> always agreed with George Ladd the idea that Jesus could come back this second and take you off to heaven, that doesn't help. I'll be very diplomatic there. That just doesn't work very well. <clears throat> okay. Let's take five and turn it over to... Uh, yes. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Anthony, uh, when, when are you on? Uh, when do you do your podcast? You Sunday on? mornings. Sunday morning, okay. Yes, yeah, Sunday mornings. It's all at our website. We've been doing it for weeks now, and we do Q and A every couple of weeks as well. So, meeting a lot of XJWs, a lot of former Jehovah's Witnesses, thousands of them out there, longing to hear from you. By the way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, Anthony. So yeah. I'm gonna keep the stream going. Yeah, fine. Wonderful. You wanna you. watch? Yeah, uh, I'd love to. Dale. So I'll, I'll put you back to where you can just uh, listen in. Okay. <laughs> Craig. Hi. We're gonna Hi. put uh, Dale's PowerPoint on the computer now. If you if you guys need to change uh, laptops. Or is this the only laptop you have? The only one we have. So okay. I, I think we can do it. How how does that work? Uh you can. can you, you do it at the same time. Yeah, actually, you can share the screen, Joe. As as you know. Can you? You can't. Can you? You can't see our screen right now, right? Uh yeah, I see you. Mm -hmm. we, uh, yeah. But, uh, how do we, how do we share? Oh, here, right. Okay, I see it. Right. Here. So open, open the PowerPoint, and then you click on share screen. Okay. How about, how about this right here? Can you see that? There you go. Yep. That's it. Beautiful. So let's go. And then you go slot. Yep. Okay. And you That's it. it. Okay. So we're but, gonna, we're gonna point it towards Dale also. Exactly. So we can. So we can see it. And if you can prop it up somewhere, the laptop, so you, it can try and be on, on level with not just looking up to Dell, if you can, if not. Oh, okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, oh, there, you want to see, can you see the screen on there? Oh, that's it. That's perfect. Is that good? Oh, actually, um, up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Can you, can you stop the sharing for a minute? Sharing oh, screen. Yeah, right here. Oh yeah. Right Stop share. Okay. Uh, can you can you lower the the laptop a bit? Yeah. Lower the. All right. Can you get the laptop? Is there a table behind you, Joe? Yeah, uh, there's a table right there. Yeah. Or uh, we. I want I need the laptop as close as possible to Tuggy so I can get the sound. Okay, uh, we're kind of limited, but I'll try to get it closer. Yeah, yeah, as, as close as you can. Thank you. 
on on a table or something. It's gonna be pretty loud because I'm using this. Uh, oh, good, good. You got a mic. That's about as far as we can go, Carlos. Is that? That's our... fine. That's fine. Thank you. That's great. And then you can share the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, let's see how I share that now. All right, let's go back. To... No? no, I think. Okay, hold on. Let me get, let me get out of here and go oh, back and make sure the clicker works here, right? Okay, share right here. Share that screen. Yeah, that's where I can test that. That should be it, huh? Yep, that's it. Okay. I, that's it. Uh, and um, can. So is it gonna flip over? Yeah, Dale is gonna. Um, can oh, you, there we go. Perfect. His little his that. That's okay. We that's okay. Yeah. No, yep. It's covering that. Let me let me know. Okay Here. Okay. How does that look, Carlos? Everything look okay? Great. Thank you, Joe. Okay. About two minute warning then. No worries. Thank you. What does that mean? The host has asked you to start your video. Yeah, sorry. Can you start the video? I, I mistakenly stopped your video. Okay. Just click on. St there you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, I'm excited about this. This is a good subject. Of a uh, 
wider project of mine to try to understand uh, the prologue of the fourth gospel as it was actually understood when it was written, when it was first perceived by the original audience. In the last couple of years, I have bought and read many, many commentaries on the gospel according to John. And most of them are, when they get to the prologue, they're incredibly distracted by later ideas. They just, they just cannot get themselves to try to get into John's head uh, and what this might have meant when the gospel was originally written. And uh, they immediately start talking about multiple persons and one God and so on. Um, now, let me make an analogy. <clears throat> Imagine that you're reading a letter by Thomas Jefferson, written in the year 1775. And in that letter, he says something about, you know, he wants this new country that he hopes to help found to be, you know, truly connected or something like this. And you're reading this and you say to yourself, aha, Thomas Jefferson invented the internet. <laughs> well, that's just wrong, right? He was talking about the internet. Even if he starts, even if he says something about an information superhighway, I mean, it's just coincidence, right? Um, the idea of the internet never entered into his mind. And the internet just has nothing to do with Thomas Jefferson's writings. And even if you try to smudge it a little bit and say, well, maybe he, maybe the roots of the internet are here. Maybe the foundations of the internet are here, or you try to fudge it, kind of have it both ways. It is about the internet and it's not. No, that's just wrong. It's an anachronism to think that Thomas Jefferson is ever saying anything about the internet. Okay, now this is obvious. I'm talking about the problem that historians call anachronism. This is when you project back in history something that just didn't exist at that time. Okay, now whenever the Gospel of John was written, and this is a matter of dispute, some think it was in the 90s, some think it was somewhat earlier, decades earlier than that. But let's say it was written between 50 and 100 AD, okay? Whenever John was written, there's a big, big time gap to when this triune God language was enforced on the church by the emperor Theodosius. The idea of a triune God was made mandatory by the emperor in the year 381 mm. at the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople. And you don't even see any reference to this idea of three persons and one God until right before that council, really like the 370s mostly. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a required idea. It was people speculating. Okay, well, the emperor came in, said the latter-day Nicenes are correct. Everybody else is a heretic. They don't count as Christians. We're going to seize their churches, get rid of their bishops. Okay, so when this idea of a triune God became mandatory, it's pretty precise. It was 381. Okay, so whenever John was written, there's more time between when John was written and when the Trinity was promulgated, the, the triune God doctrine. There's more time between those two things than there is between our time and Thomas Jefferson. Right? You can do the math later. But... Uh, there's a vast time gap between 2020 and, and 1775, right? There's well, even a vaster time gap between 381 and 95. Okay, so when we're reading John and we're trying to figure out what he is and is not saying in his very interesting introductory portion here, uh, we have to just put off to one side these later ideas because we know they never entered into his mind. The idea of three hypostases is one of a tripersonal God. He doesn't mention this in his gospel. He doesn't imply it. He doesn't presuppose it. Um, any God he talks about is a single person. Um, and I won't get into the other uh, technicalities because I want to move on. Okay, so what I'm going to spend the most time um, worrying about in this presentation is what on earth is he up to here in this opening salvo, this sentence with three claims in it? So he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's how it's usually translated. Uh, and my question is, is he referring to the same God twice, or is, re is he referring to two different gods? Right? 
So he uses different forms of the Greek word theos two times in this passage. He says, kai uh, halagos ein pros tam theon, and the word was with God. And then kai theos ein halagos, and God was the word. Um, how many gods is he talking about? Is he referring to the same to the same one twice, or is he referring to two different ones? And, he, and there's two different reference to the word God. That's the question of interpretation. Now, some people uh, want to fuss endlessly about how to translate that last uh, <clears throat> phrase. Uh, it doesn't use the word the in front of God when he says God was the word in the last part there. And so technically it could be translated a God. And some people like the Jehovah's Witnesses argue that it should be translated and the word was a God. <laughs> Uh, others like to say, no, it's not a God. Um, they correctly make the point that in the New Testament, you can refer to God with or without a V, with or without the definite article. So, you know, typically it uses uh, the word the hotheos, uh, but it doesn't have to, and it can still refer to God. You don't have to translate it as a God just because it's lacking the word the in front of it. Um, some modern translators say, no, it's something like the word was divine, or uh, what God was, the word was, or things like this. Um, I don't really think it matters, because the question is going to be the same, however you translate this. And I don't think fussing about the translation is going to solve, is going to answer this question that I'm asking, right? If we translate it of God, same question. Okay, this God we're talking about, the word is, is this the same God we just mentioned before, or is it a different one? Right? And if you're saying that the Lagos is divine, well, what is it to be divine? It's to be a God. Right? Okay. So is this God the same God that was mentioned before, or is it a different one? And if it's saying what, what God was, the word was, I mean, isn't that just a roundabout way of saying that the word was divine? Okay, so back to the same question. Did we just refer to the same God twice in two different ways? Which would be this. Just talking about one God there, one reference. Or are we talking about two different gods in this passage? And um, so that's the question I want to address. Now, a lot of people just... Um, they cannot bring themselves to address this question. Yes, yeah, changing. We're good. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, a lot of people can't bring themselves to address this question, and they use this old crutch that, hey, you know, John is a paradoxical kind of guy. And he is just not able to be consistent. In fact, he's inconsistent with himself right here in the very first sentence of his book. He just, you know, he takes one step and he falls flat on his face as far as consistency is concerned. So Trinitarian evangelical theologian Miller Erickson says, commenting on this passage, the issue of the paradoxical relationship of the Son, or Word, to the Father is faced immediately. Here in John 1.1 1, 1 is the seeming contradiction of the Word being God and yet not being God. The word's with God, he must be somebody else then. Oh, but the word was God. No, nope, that's just God himself. Now, look, <laughs> when you're interpreting anybody, whether you're reading the Bible or a column by humorist Dave Barry, um, if you think he's just contradicting himself in the opening sentence, I mean, okay, Dave Barry is a bad example. Maybe he's just being funny, okay? But, um, in a serious source, if, if you're interpreting it and the author's contradicting himself right off the bat, you've probably made a big mistake. Because the author's probably not stupid, he's probably confident to remain consistent with himself for the space of one sentence, right? So this is really just a non-starter to start gassing about paradoxes. And, uh, you know, to congratulate John for being super mysterious. Um, this, you know, I have found that uh, misery loves company, that's a true saying, 
but also uh, confusion loves company. And people who are confused about Jesus and God uh, love to project their own confusion onto this book. It just lends itself mm -hmm. to that because of its abstract terminology. But um, come on, let's be serious. The guy, the guy is not that confused, right? Um, so let's see what else we can come up with. And honestly, I don't think that that option was taken seriously early. There wasn't this tradition of celebrating apparent contradictions as wonderful mysteries. Um, they, they actually tried to make sense of it. Now, normally in the New Testament, when you see the word God, it's almost always the Father. That's just how they use the word. Now, they occasionally depart from this. You know, they'll, they'll refer in Hebrews 1a to a God who has a God. Well, that can't be God. There's talk about the God of this world. And, well, that's not God. But in any context, when you see God in the New Testament, there's this general rule, and this is expressed by this scholar who wrote a whole book about whether Jesus is called God in the New Testament and how many times maybe that is. And so he's exhaustively surveyed all the usage of the word theos in the New Testament. And this is, this is his summation of you know, what it means. He says, whenever theos or hot theos, that's without the D or with the D, whenever those are found in the New Testament, we are to assume that hapater, the father, is the reference, unless the context makes this impossible. Sorry, I meant to be on that one there. Um, Right, so when you see God, you assume it's the Father, unless that just doesn't make any sense in the context. Um, okay, so let's apply this to the sentence that we're looking at here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Father, and the Word was the Father. Mm, I like that. Okay, interesting. Well, remember, we're exploring two options. Is he talking about the same God in two different ways, or is he talking two different gods. There are two, are there two different reference for the term theos in this passage. So the other option would be, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Father, and the Word was a God. Anyway, not the Father himself, but somebody else. God in addition to the Father. So those would be the options. Now, if we put one other assumption in there, and I have to say this is just an assumption it's not something that I am telling you is true, but it's something that a lot of people bring to the text. They look down in verse 14, and it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, well, starting in, at least in verse 14, that's definitely the man Jesus Christ they're talking about. Right, and then it immediately goes off talking about how awesome Jesus is and how he's greater than Moses and everything. Um, they say, aha, well, so the word must mean Jesus. <laughs> The same person who, or same person who later became the man Jesus. So, if we were to suppose that the logos, the word here, is the Son, then these would be the two options. In the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father. That should, that should, that should grate on your Christian ears, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, or here's the other option. In the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was a God in addition to the Father. Uh, hmm. Maybe a strange thought. I thought there was only one God. Is that really what John is saying? Um, that turned out actually to be a surprisingly popular uh, view, at least by the time you got to the end of the 100s. So there are these four options, really, in interpreting this, this sentence. Um, either it's the same God or it's not the same God, the second God that's mentioned, the second Theos that's mentioned. And either we're going to assume that the Word is, just is the Son, that those are the same, the same one, or not. Maybe they're different. Okay? And it looks like just logically those are all the options. The second Theos that's mentioned, um, it's either the same God as the one mentioned before, or it's another one. And uh, the Logos is either supposed to be the Son or it's not. So this, I think, is how the earliest, well, not the earliest, but uh, Christians in the era that I'm concerned about looked at this. 
And I'm, I'm specifically talking about um, end of the 100s and the early 200s. And interestingly, uh, and this is a very difficult subject, what was going on in Christian theology in the end of the 100s and the early 200s. There aren't a whole lot of sources. The sources that we have are all from one side and are just viciously denouncing the other side as horrible heretics. And so it's actually quite hard to figure out what, what all of these people were saying. But interestingly, if you just map out these four logical options in interpreting John 1, I believe that they just map easily onto mainstream Christian theology as of the year, say, 200. Okay, so, uh, right, this is how we would read them. Let's go through the options. So starting in the upper left. So if we're assuming that the same God and the Word is the Son, the same, same being as the Son. In the beginning was the Son, the Son was with the Father, and the Son was the Father. Well, this is what those people were saying, who historians since the 1800s have called modalistic monarchians, right? Or sometimes they get mocked as patropossians because they think the Son is the Father. So it was the Father who got crucified and died. Well, that, that can't be right, you know? Um, Okay, go, go on over to the next option. Uh, so if the Word is not the Son, but we're talking about the same God as the world, we're talking about the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with the Father, and the Word was the Father. This is what uh, people in this era that historians call dynamic monarchians thought. Basically, they thought, yeah, is there something divine in Jesus? Yeah, in a sense, but, you know, in John, Jesus says, my father is in me, does the works, is doing these works through me, basically. And God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, Paul says. And so, yeah, there is something divine, but there's not two natures, there's not another person in the man Jesus. There's just the man Jesus, and then there's like God's wisdom and power uh, and message that's that's in him, that's working through him. It's the Father working through him. So those are called uh, by historians dynamic monarchians. Okay, go to the third option, bottom left. If it's not the same God and the Word is the Son, then you have in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father, and the Son was a God in addition to the Father. Okay, so the Son of God is this lesser God, basically. And this is what the Logos theorists thought. People like Justin Martyr. In fact, he seems to have kind of started this whole Logos theory. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, the idea here seems to be that there's this second lesser God and uh, at, at a certain point in time, this second lesser God took on a body. But that's Jesus. So some theologians and historians call this a Logos, Sarks, Christology. There's a body, and there's the Logos, and that's what Jesus amounted to. Okay, fourth option. So the Word was not the Son, uh, and this is not the same God we're talking about as before. When we're talking about the Word. So the bottom right of this chart. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with the Father, and the Word was a God in addition to the Father. These are Logos theorists that said, well, the one true God, now that's the Father. But there's also this lesser God. And um, this lesser God, in the fullness of time, uh, kind of partnered up with a man. And so when you're looking at Jesus, there's really two persons there. There's the man, miraculously conceived, the son of Mary, descendant of David, and so on. There's the man, but there's also this, this ancient uh, lesser deity that was around before the world existed and God created through him, and he's, he's there as well. And this is exactly what Origen thought, what Tertullian thought. Um, now, is that a good idea? I'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, so I think as far as, you know, roughly around the, two, the year 200 is concerned, um, th this is what you had as far as interpreting John 1. You had uh, Logos theorists, and then you had Monarchians of two different kinds. 
and um, I think that's kind of revealing. Now, what does, what does the word end up being on these four options? You know, what, what's the bottom line about the Christology? Again, start at the upper left here. So if the word just is the Son, and we're talking about the same God, then the word or the Son, same thing, is a mode or attribute or action of God that is of the Father by which God animated the body resulting in Jesus. I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's docetism. Hmm. God, you know, puppeteering a body, that's not a man. Uh, go down one. If it's not the same God, but the Word is the Son. So now we have the Word, or the Son, is a lesser God in addition to God the Father, who gained a body and so lived as Jesus. I'm sorry, I think that's docetism. Like, docetism is Jesus is not really a man. Just he looks like one, sure, but yeah, he actually isn't one. He's some other kind of being, um, right? So why would you think that a lesser deity who could somehow get itself a human body? Why would you think that was a man? Why would you think that is, as C.S. Lewis would say, a son of Adam and daughter, or a daughter of Eve? Looks like it wouldn't be, right? If a demon could. Uh, somehow get rid of you and take over your body, suppose that was possible, that demon would not thereby become a human, right? It'd be a demon with a body. Probably be going around, if movies have taught me anything, it would be talking in a growly voice and drooling and <laughs> cursing at priests. Um, okay, so, I mean, it looks, it looks like you don't have a human Jesus on these two left options. Uh, go to the upper right one, so the word is not the son, and we're talking about the same God when we talk about the logos in theos. Um, so then the word would be something like a mode, like a way God is, an attribute or an action of God the Father, which was active through the man Jesus. That's the dynamic monarchy. And so you have a man, and he's empowered by God to do signs and wonders among you. Hmm, that sounds familiar. I might have heard that somewhere before. Fourth option, bottom right. It's the word is not the Son, um, but we're not talking about the same God when we talk about the Logos. So the word is a lesser God in addition to God the Father. Um, this lesser God lived in a mysterious union with the man, Jesus. Now, so you have an ancient divine son I don't say eternal because these Logos theorists were really squishy about that. Some of them, like Tertullian, very clearly say that um, God, when it was time to create, you know, he wanted to not do a Kirka directly, so then he brought into existence this Logos, and then he had the Logos created for him. Okay, so the Logos is ancient, it exists, it was already there when creation happened, but it's not eternal. On that view. Others said no, the, the Logos is eternal. Um, but if you go back far enough in time, it was like God's reason or something. I don't think that's coherent. I don't think that's that makes any sense at all, but that's what some of them thought. Um, okay. Now I'm not going to talk more about the development of theology right now, but some of you who have studied the development of theology of the first four or five hundred years of Christianity, which of these four options is the main way that mainstream orthodoxy went? By the time you get to the three and four hundreds, like which of the four is closest to what they thought? You think it's the first one? There were people who thought that, like Marcellus and maybe Athanasius. Um, the upper left one. But I would argue that's one of the other ones. Lower right one, the word is the lesser God. I think it's the lower right one. Yeah. When they started talking about two natures, um, they had a human nature and a divine nature in Jesus, and the natures were beings, like cells. So the divine nature in Jesus, the way they thought about it was it was it was a God. 
the lesser god, um, they eventually started saying that it was eternal, just like God the Father is eternal. Uh, and then the human nature, that was a man. So orthodoxy really kind of headed in the direction of the fourth option, although they don't, they don't talk about two sons. They forbade talking about it that way. But the two natures view that one out basically is the same as the fourth option. Okay. But never mind that. Our, our question is, uh, what does John mean? What is John up to? Okay. Let's, let's not get in a tizzy about councils and later developments. Uh, we're thinking when this was written in the year 90 or the year 70, 68 or whenever this was written, um, what, what was meant, what would the original uh, recipients have understood? Okay. Well, I think if you move on just slightly in the prologue and see what it says next, I think it points us in a certain direction, right? So verse three, all things came into being through him, that's the word, and without him, the word, not one thing came into being. Now, this is something that John's audience would have been familiar with, right? This idea that God creates through his word was not something new in John's time. As a matter of fact, if you were paying attention at all in the synagogue or equally well in early Christianity, um, you, you just couldn't miss this idea of God creating through his word, right? The very beginning of the Hebrew Bible in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Right? So he created by speaking. Now, later on, he says, let us make man in our image and likeness. And most contemporary interpreters think that he's addressing the divine council there, what we would call angels. But even though he says, hey, let us do this, it proceeds then to say that he did it. In the singular verb. So he, you know, I think it's like when you're uh, you're hanging out at Thanksgiving and your grandma says, hey, let's make some more pie. We're going to run out of pie. And then she makes it herself. So she's kind of announcing her intention, but, you know, she doesn't really need your help. You're no good at making pie. She, she's a master chef. And you're not. Um, so, yeah, in the Old Testament, God uh, is credited in Genesis with creating everything just by speaking it into existence. And obviously the word there is not like a helper for God, right? It's not like there were two involved, God, oh, and also God's word. It was like a group project. That's, that idea just isn't there, right? Um, another famous passage that sounds more like John because it talks about the word of the Lord Psalm says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. Right? Kind of saying the same thing twice. Psalm 148, let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. So again, God does it without, inner, without any helper, without any intermediary. He just says it so and it's so. And that's, that's pretty impressive way of creating, isn't it? That's not how we create. When we create, we have to go and assemble all the materials, get yourself a bunch of plywood and screws and nails and stuff, and then, then you go to work. But God just says, let it be, and it is. Okay, so, you know, in the prophets, he very emphatically takes 100% of the credit for creating. Isaiah 45, 12, I made the earth and created humankind upon it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. Isaiah 44, 24. I am Yahweh who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who by myself spread out the earth. Okay. I think we need to plug in that laptop right now. Oh, yeah. So, right... 
uh, do you have to take this literally that God, you know, literally got his hands dirty? I don't think so, but saying it, saying I did it with my own hands is a way of emphatically saying that it was all me, right? Like, I didn't order this from a catalog. I didn't ask somebody to, to do this for me. It was just 100% me. So, let me pause here for a second. Solve our power crisis. There we go. Thank you, guys. So it's pretty clear that in the Old Testament, God's creating word isn't an agent in addition to God. There's one, there's one actor, there's one agent, there's one doer there. That's the Lord God Almighty. And uh, there is talk about his word, but right, word, word isn't a, a second God or a second creator or anything like that. Um, now, I think this is relevant for interpreting John 1. And I got some help here from uh, somebody you may or may not have heard of. Uh, do any of you know who Nathaniel Lardner was? I wish more people did. He is one of the greatest apologists of all time and also one of the greatest patristic scholars of all time. He had this insanely encyclopedic, encyclopedic knowledge of ancient sources. And uh, he could read them in the original languages. And he published these giant tomes kind of defending the reliability of New Testament writings uh, by comparing them with other ancient writings. And um, he was what we would call a biblical Unitarian. And uh, he, had, he has a very interesting uh, letter that was written in uh, 1730 discussing John 1 and grappling with this question that I asked at the start of the presentation, is the Logos, if we're saying uh, that the Logos is a Theos, is it the same Theos that was mentioned before, or is it another one? And this is what he says. Who should this be, talking about uh, this word that made all things, but God the Father, the one living and true God, an author of life and all being? Are there more creators than one? Would any Jew or disciple of Jesus ascribe the creation of the world to any but God, or equally well, to God's reason or understanding or discretion, his wisdom, his power, his word, his spirit, which is the same as God himself? And then on the part of the prologue, it says, he came to his own and his own received him not. Still talking about the word. He says, I pray whose people were the Jews, but God's is who called himself Jehovah. So I think he's on the right track here. And I think this is something that John would have presupposed in his audience, that they were familiar with Genesis, that they were familiar with this idea that God creates through his word. And uh, there's even more I think that they would have been familiar with because there's literature in between the Testaments that equates God's word with God's wisdom. And um, that, I think, connects John's prologue to Proverbs chapter 8. But I'm not going to talk about that today for lack of time. So if we go back to our four options, um, it looks like you shouldn't say it's not the same God. You should say it is the same God that we were talking about before. And then that would leave us with the top two options. But remember, I thought that upper left one was docetic. It has a Jesus that only appears to be human and isn't really a human. And so, obviously, John is against this. If you read the first letter from John, he denounces uh, people who will say that Christ came in the flesh. Coming in the flesh means being a man. right? So if your doctrine of Christ is that he's some kind of wonderful, heavenly something or other, but he had the appearance of a man, John is very against that. So we, we know he's not going to endorse any kind of Gnosticism. And so I think you can rule out three of the four options. And basically, I think the dynamic monarchians were correct. Whatever the Logos is, it's not a being. It's, it's like a, an attribute or an action of God or even both. Okay, so how did... We already mentioned that orthodoxy eventually broke hard in the direction of the fourth option here, the lower right of the chart. How did that happen? 
Well, basically it happened because of law. <laughs> and this you can trace right back to the early ex-Platonist and Christian philosopher, Justin Martyr, who died and was martyred because he wouldn't deny his Christian faith in about the year 165. Uh, very interesting character, Justin Martyr. We have this long dialogue with Trifo the Jew that he wrote that may derive from an actual conversation he had with a rabbi in 135 or so. Um, and we have some apologies that he wrote, kind of public defenses of Christianity. Um, and kind of weirdly, he, he wore the philosopher's toga. There was a special outfit that he would wear as a philosopher uh, in ancient times in Greece and Rome. And um, he's one of the first people to do this, really, one of the few to do this. It's kind of like the Hindu holy men, where they would wear a special hairdo or a special outfit. Like, oh, that's a holy man, right? Philosophers, they weren't, you know, university professors, but they were considered to have, you know, some wonderful mystical knowledge to be kind of like holy men. But he, he tried to have it both ways. He wanted to be a Christian. He didn't think that the, the Platonists could really give you knowledge of God. Um, but he thought that you could get knowledge of God through studying prophecy and um, learning through Jesus and things like that. So he did become a Christian. But whether he left behind all of his Platonic ideas is another thing. Um, he tells us in his uh, kind of biographical account that you know he, he was a con he was like a convert to Platonism. Platonism was basically a religion in those days. And, but then he converted away. But anyway, there was this idea that was current. Um, and it was due really to Plato, the philosopher in the 300s BC. And he wrote this dialogue called the Timaeus. And the Timaeus has this long yarn about creation and how all things supposedly came to be. And it's just this imaginary tale. It's not clear what you're supposed to make of this whether he actually thinks it's true or not. But in part of it, uh, the ultimate source, what we would call God, uh, God is too uh, high and separate from this cruddy, dirty, nasty world down here to have any direct interaction with it. And so in this tale that Plato tells, um, the way that God creates is he can't do it by himself. Um, so first, he kind of emanates out this other being called the Demiurge, or the craftsman. Uh, and it says, this, this being is neither created nor uncreated. He's like halfway in between. So he needs this in-between being to create, because somehow he can't do it. Now, this is a very strange idea that an all-powerful God can't create the heavens and the earth. How, how would you be all-powerful if you couldn't do that? But this is what they thought. So um, people like Justin thought that uh, there had to be this lesser God that created directly on behalf of God the Father. This is the Logos. <laughs> they also thought in this time, so we're talking about mid-100s on through the mid-200s. Mere man Christology, obviously that's wrong. This is when they coined the phrase mere man. Salanthropos theory. It was mocking the non logos spirits. Like, mere Jesus is just a guy. Ha, ah, dummies, that's a mere man. I think this is mind bogglingly um, wrong headed. To call the Messiah with all that's involved in being a Messiah a mere man is stupid. But they thought that, you know, no matter how high Jesus' calling was, no matter how much God empowered him, how much God did through him, they thought, well, if there wasn't another being in there, then that's a, quote, mere man. And uh, they just thought, hey, the way you detect beings is by their actions or the results of the actions. So if you see crying or that's a sign of sufferings. So you know, there's really a man there. So there must have been a man there. But if you see miracles and divine teaching, oh, there must be a God there. Hmm. And so there must be a man and a God there in Jesus. Well, it can't be a high God because 
Uh, in one place, toward the end of his dialogue with Trico, Justin Martyr says, he basically mocks the idea that God could be incarnate. It's not even the stupidest person would think that the high God could come down to some little corner of this earth and do stuff here. They did not believe that Jesus was God incarnate. No. They thought Jesus was an incarnation of his second lesser God. And Justin literally calls him the second God. And he's very clear that he's a lesser God as well. He says we hold him in the second place, like we honor him. Not as much as we honor God, but anyway, more than the others, he, he comes in second place. Isn't that pretty good? He gets a silver medal. That, that's how he viewed it. And there's the Holy Spirit which is the third place, and the angels below that. He says this in a couple of places explicitly. Um, yeah, so when you see Jesus' divine teaching and his miracles, oh, there's a God there. Now, the dynamic monarchians, I think, have the right answer to this. Yes, there is a God there. And he tells you which one. He says, my father does his works in me. That's the God in Jesus. God was in Christ reconciling the world to itself. You don't need this lesser God theory. Um, you know, look, this, this looking at effects and discerning what kind of being they come from, th this is stupid. Uh, if you looked at Moses and saw him part the Red Sea, and predict the future and, and deliver God's law to the people, you say, aha, Moses must be a God man. There must be a divine nature there. No. God empowered Moses. Okay, well, even to a greater degree, God empowered Jesus. In this gospel, he says, he mentions that God gives inside his spirit without measure. Okay. So this, this is Logos theory. This was a theory that was popular with some of the elites in, um, in Rome, where Justin Martyr was active and in other highly educated places. And why was that? Well, it was pretty embarrassing to educated pagans and people from the pagan backgrounds in the 100s. It was pretty embarrassing that Christianity was this religion founded, you know, 100 years ago or less by this Jew, those are weirdos, they don't, nobody likes the Jews, by this weird Jew who got himself killed seemingly for some kind of crime against the state or who knows what, right? So Jesus was an embarrassment to these guys. Some of these people who were Christians and wanted to defend Christianity because he was a Jew, you know, he's a Jew with a criminal record, basically. In fact, he got the death penalty. I mean, who would keep company like that? So yeah, obviously, uh, this lesser god, the Logos, this was the same god that inspired all the Greek philosophers. It's like God's reason, and it's like the reason that, that's in all of us, but especially in the great philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Stoics. And uh, so yeah, our religion, yeah, we have God, sure, but we also have this Logos. This is really awesome because this is actually who is inspiring all these wonderful guys like you guys. Plato. Uh, executed Jew. <clears throat> Did we mention the, the Logos, who's the direct creator, uh, who inspires all men of reason, people like us? So, I mean, some of these guys like Athenagoras uh, and Theophilus, they will write whole books defending Christianity. They don't mention Jesus one time. But they will mention this guy, the this, this second God, because it was cool. It was one of the cool kids were interested in back then. Now, I said that this was an elite view in that time. How do I know that? Nobody did a uh, Barnum poll among all the Christians back then. Um, I mean, I don't think the early Christians were very theological. I don't think they had a lot of systematic thinking about God and Christ. It was more kind of just on a practical level. But some of the Logos theorists, especially Tertullian and Origen, who are the two most prominent um, Logos theorists in the early 200s, uh, Tertullian up to about 225 or 30, and Origen died, I think it was 254. Um, they tell us repeatedly that the common, the common herd of Christians 
who aren't as smart as them. Don't like this Logos theory business. And they're always objecting that, hey, we don't believe in two gods. We don't believe in two creators. Where'd you guys get this stuff from? They talk about this. They mention it repeatedly. Uh, and they, they're, they're really pretty dismissive about it because they, they think this is oh so smart. Um, but look, even in the baptismal creeds, that the earliest creeds that we have, that they would um, have new converts uh, confess to be baptized. They begin like all the early creeds. You know, we believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, Creator of the heavens and the earth. Okay, well. There's one creator there, right? <laughs> and there's one God, and that's the Father Almighty. So one God, one creator. Um, they didn't like talking about, they, they found offensive this idea that God had to do it directly, or the Logos is really the direct creator, but God's kind of sponsoring the whole thing. And their slogan was against the Logos theorists, we, are faithful to apostolic tradition, we uphold the monarchy of the Father. This is why they're called monarchians by historians. You know, the rule, the reign, the regime of one God, the Father. And so monarchians are basically people who rejected Logos theory. And according to some of the Logos theory people, they were the majority and they were the common folk among Christians, not the elite. And, um, how late does this go on? Well, things aren't terribly clear. I'll, I'll give you a kind of answer in a minute. But um, So this two gods or one god question uh, is really a difficult one for the Logos theorists. Um, one of the most exciting discoveries in the history of early Christian theology was in the 20th century, they discovered a lost a little dialogue by Origen, who was the greatest early Christian scholar, basically. And there was this bishop named Heraclides, or Clides, and he was teaching something that people thought sounded off. So they held a conference of bishops, and they brought in Origen to kind of try to set the guy straight. So it wasn't like later councils. Uh, it wasn't sponsored by the emperor. It wasn't a judicial kind of council that was going to throw you out and excommunicate you, things like that. It was a meeting, it was a synod of bishops, but they were just, you know, let's all come and reason together and see if we can work this out. And so in this dialogue, Origen, you know, he kind of intimidates this poor guy and questions him in front of everybody. And uh, these are Origen's words as reported in the dialogue. He says, God is the Almighty, the uncreated, the supreme who made all things. Christ Jesus, who was in the form of God, being other than the God in whose form he existed. Right? He was in the form of God, that means he's not God, that means he's like God. Was, he says, this Jesus was a God before he came into the body. In one sense, there are two gods, while in another sense, there is one God. And later on, he says, now, I hey, some of the brethren take offense that we talk about two gods. He, he says this because there was probably a gasp from, you know, these bishops. But, um, you know, it didn't really bother him that much. Um, if you're talking about God just like a powerful being, then there's two of them. There's God and then there's the Logos. They're two different beings. And he thinks the, the God eternally generated the Logos. But he clearly thinks the Logos is not the same God as God, as God the Father. Um, and if you want to talk about God in the sense of the ultimate source of everything else, well, there's this one God, that's the Father Almighty. It's pretty sad. Okay, so now he believes in two gods. If a God is like a powerful self, he does have two gods. He's got one true God, he's got this lesser God. But Eventually, orthodoxy ends up in a different place. So in the revised Nicene Creed of 381, this is from the Council at Constantinople, I think they understood the same words differently in 325 and 381. 
if you want to see what I mean by that, it's just in a chapter of my book, What is the Trinity? But part of the famous Nicene Creed says, We believe in one in one Lord Jesus Christ, in the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all eons, before all ages, light of light, true God from true God, mm -hmm. begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Okay. Here we have two instances of the word God. And now we are actually talking about Trinitarians, people who believe that there are three persons in God. How many gods do they think they're referring to? One. Yeah. Um, but the things they're referring to are they're not they're not the triune God as such, right? They're in the triune God. They're referring to two different in their terms, what? Two persons. Yeah. These persons, which supposedly share the divine essence, they're calling them God. Okay, so they're talking about two gods. They're using the word God equivocally. It refers uh, the true God that's from the true God. The first true God they mention there is the Son, or the Logos, the Word. And the second one is supposed to be the Father. Okay, so now they're not talking about in their mind, they're not talking about two gods. They're talking about two, quote, gods, two different ones which are called God. Strictly speaking, it's the Trinity which they think is God. Um, so it's all together, which is God. Uh, but, but they're willing, because those share the divine essence, to call each of us God. Another later development, which when you first learn it is kind of shocking, is that they, they kind of deliberately forgot about the long arms period. And uh, it's in this quotation from Athanasius, uh, the famous you know, polemicist on behalf of the Nicene Creed, writing during the controversy that came after the 325 Council. And basically in this quote, he's mocking the idea that God would have had to create indirectly through another. And that was the whole idea with the modern theory. But now it's stupid. Now we've forgotten about it. So they kind of use Logos theories to get a second God into the picture. Oh, because God couldn't create directly. And by the time you go on 100, 150 years, like, oh, well, obviously there was only one God involved in creation, not two. It's, it's bizarre, right? So he says if the Arians, the so-called Arians, say that the Logos or the Son alone was brought to be by God alone, and other things were created by God through the Son, right? That's precisely what Justin Martyr thought. That's precisely what, <laughs> although it was eternal generation, it's precisely what Tertullian thought. But now, now that he, he seems to think the Arians just came up with this out of the blue on their own, which is foolish and uninformed. Okay, this he says is a futile and novel idea. Well, it's novel. <laughs> 150 wasn't novel in 345 whenever he's writing it. Again, it is irreligious to suppose that God disdained as if a humble task to form the creatures himself, which came after the Son. He, through his word, made all things small and great. Really, um, Athanasius thinks that fundamentally God and the word are the same being. He just thinks God, God's word animated the body. So he's like, no, there aren't two creators, just one creator. I'm just forgetting what they were saying earlier. Another later development, the idea of different persons saying God. So here we have the famous Western Bishop Augustine mangling in John 17, 1 through 3. It says, well, the proper order of the words is that they may know you and Jesus Christ, who you have sent as the one true God. Mm. No, it's not, it's not the proper word of the words, right? He's just like, well, this doesn't sound like Trinitarian orthodoxy. There must have been some mistake here. Well, there is some mistake here, but it's Augustine's, mm -hmm. right? Consequently, therefore, the Holy Spirit is also understood, blah, blah, blah. Nor are the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit three gods, but the Trinity itself is, a, is the one only true God, and yet Father and Son are three persons. Okay. 
Well, John didn't have that kind of idea going on. There's zero evidence in the Gospel of John about an idea of multiple persons in God. So, um, as far as the timeline, um, honestly, I don't think any of these ideas have really ever died out. But uh, what you see in history is, as you enter the Middle Ages, the mainstream church becomes very uniform. Information is strictly controlled. Churches are strictly controlled. Who gets to be a bishop is strictly controlled. And um, if you have some of these other opinions, you're just, you're out of luck. So if, if, if the view is that Jesus is a man who's empowered by God to do amazing things as God's Messiah, and the one true God, that's the Father, you want to know where did that start? Well, have you ever read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? That's exactly what you have. Jesus doesn't pre-exist. Jesus is a God. Jesus is the Son of God and a real man. Well, it's the same in John, really, once you understand John. Although John has been made difficult to interpret by later traditions. <coughs> okay, but then you have this intermediate state where you've got the one true God. Oh, and there's also this lesser God. And you have this as soon as you have the Logos theories come in, right around the 150 with Justin Martyr, and then a bunch of people, you know, piggybacking on the thoughts of Justin Martyr. And you have those people all the way up through the year 381 and beyond, um, where you have the so-called Aryan, the barbarian tribes. Uh, Eusebius, the famous church historian that you've probably heard of, he thought this exactly, greater and lesser God. By the time you get to about 381, you have uh, those three gods, so-called gods, three quote gods, but they're really just persons who are really the same God, the person in the, in the divine nature, and the one true God. Um, but you don't you don't see that in the time of John, you don't see it in the time of Justin, but you do see it right around just before that year 381. Okay, so the way I think. Uh, John and his audience would have heard this. Something like this. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, and in Greek, he, he says it the other way around. I, I take it that as being emphatic. In Greek, he says, and God was the Word. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think is he, he doesn't say Hologos, the God, is because if he said Hologos, it might make you think that God is the subject of that third assertion. But no, the subject of these first three claims is the word that he's making claims about. The word was in the beginning, the word was with God, and God was the word. What he's telling you is it's not somebody else. Okay, but arguably he's still personifying here. He, I put those quotation marks in. Of course, in ancient times, they didn't exist, quotation marks. And it's a shame because they make things a lot clearer um, in certain instances. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, this word of God. And without him, not one thing came into being. So I, I'm, I'm on the side of the dynamic monarchies here. Now, just before I finish, just one objection in my answer. When you read Trinitarian commenters, they love to wax eloquent about the meaning of cross, the Greek word which is usually translated with. And they say, well, this shows you that the logos is not some kind of abstract idea or divine <coughs> attribute or divine action. No, the logos is definitely, it's a someone because it's said to be with God, be with like face to face or maybe uh, he's mediating between God and humans. But anyway, it's a person-to-person -person kind of relationship that, that this communicates to say that the word is prompts God, towards God, with God, with God like person-to-person -person at their point. Okay, what I'm suggesting is no, the word of God is just a way of referring to God like his, his, his wisdom uh, or something like that. And, uh, it's not a self in its own right. It's not an additional God or additional person. So how could, how could a non-self be said to be with God in that sense? Okay, here's my answer. Proverbs chapter 8. 
from the Septuagint version, which the New Testament writers would have looked at. He says, He, the Lord, established me. This is Lady Wisdom, this character I hopefully you remember her from Proverbs. She's calling out, you know, fools, you know, gain me, I'm more valuable than gold and silver, and all this stuff. Well, she's talking here. He established me before time in the beginning. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Okay. Before he made the earth, even before he made the depths, before the mountains were settled, and before all hills, he begets me. When he, God, prepared the heavens, I, Lady Wisdom, was present with him. And when he prepared his throne upon the winds, and when he strengthened the foundations of the earth, I was by him, suiting myself to him. I was that wherein he took delight, and daily I rejoiced in his presence continually. Now let me ask you, when God created the heavens and the earth, did he have this lady helping him? <laughs> or a female spirit, like a goddess or something? But well, look at all this personal language here, man. She's rejoicing in his presence. She's present with him. She was by him. Doesn't that sound like a person-to-person -person relationship? Yes, it does. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is my answer. This was a familiar tradition, and it's not only in this book, it's in some other books that are written before John. It's not only in Proverbs, it's in some later Jewish writings. So, yeah, I, I think this is something the audience could handle. Uh, they could see that the word was being personified. And this is what personification is, right? If a guy uh, has a boat and he loves his boat, he says, I want to spend the rest of my life with her. She, she's my one and only. I guess he's really lonely or something. He's a rich guy. No wife. Uh, that doesn't mean his boat is a lady, right? That means he's talking about his boat in highly personal terms. He's personifying the boat. Right? So whenever you have personification, this is what it is. It's personal language being applied to something. Okay. I think there's a lot more that needs to be said about the prologue. I think you have to show the writer's train of thought through the entire thing. And I haven't done that, but I've done the first part of it. So that's that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Awesome. Uh, We're going to have a break until 1 30. We'll meet with any of the restaurants that gather your friends. So we'll have lunch before we do that. Uh, who traveled the farthest to get here? Who of you, who of you do not have this book right here? Okay. Okay, the Richardsons. Do you have this book, Kathy? <coughs> okay, come on up and get this book, uh, Diane. Okay. <laughs> All 